Lupus is not a glamorous disease. It kills you slowly and agonizingly, ravaging your lungs. It stops you breathing, makes you cough up blood. Look, your friends and family will shun you because it's infectious. It doesn't require the mosquito vector of malaria or dengue. It doesn't need the sexual intimacy of HIV AIDS. This is the perfect assassin. All it takes is a cough, <coughs> millions of infectious droplets released, and all you folk in the front row could be infected. I see you collectively hold your breath now. <laughs> Relax, safe to breathe. You've probably figured out by now that it's tuberculosis or TB I'm speaking about, haven't you? But did you know, were you aware that this one disease over the last 200 years alone has been responsible for the death of a thousand million human beings? That's a lot of zeros. And that the deaths from TB alone far outnumber those from smallpox and plague and cholera and malaria and AIDS and influenza all put together. Ebola gets all the recent attention, doesn't it? And in the last outbreak, which lasted precisely 15 months, 11,000 people died. Terrible, publicized, agonizing deaths. But in that same time window, TB killed 2.1 million people. You didn't hear of those deaths. Perhaps they didn't matter. Yet TB is Ebola with wings. It flies through Bombay's crowded local trains ticketless, invisibly, infecting thousands every day with millions of coughs. And we're a nation of coughers. You hear the cacophony around you every day. In India, TB exists on an epic scale. It's our biggest public health problem. It refuses to go away. India houses the most TB patients in the world. TB kills the most Indians globally. One Indian dies of tuberculosis every minute. Think of it, that's a grim statistic, a shameful one, unchanged over the decades. TB costs this country $24 billion every year, something a poor country can't afford. You take this world map behind me and watch as I mathematically stretch it in proportion to deaths from TB. Finally, we emerge as the superpower we've dreamed of being. But, but perhaps not in the way that we would have wanted. I now need to introduce to you someone very important. My patient, Salma. But bear in mind that her story could have been any of yours in this room today if you'd been infected. For TB does not distinguish between the chauffeur in the front of the Mercedes from the CEO at the back, or the maid in her kitchen from the Memsaib playing bridge on her veranda. Salma was a resident of Dharavi, the world's most densely populated slum. And she had spent the last 60, six zero months before she met me, desperately fighting off her TB. In her quest, she had crisscrossed two states, UP and Maharashtra, 1,500 kilometers apart on multiple occasions. She had accessed four government clinics, 12 private practitioners, she had received countless drugs. What could be more soul-destroying than taking five years of treatment, yet find yourself getting steadily worse with each doctor visit, not better? What made Salma special? Why do I want to devote, no, dedicate my TED talk to her? Not the fact that she had TB. Sadly, millions do in this country, you've heard that. It was the type of tuberculosis she had her pattern of resistance. Let me explain, it's a simple concept. It turns out that normal TB is really easy for me to treat. I give you four drugs for six months and at a cost of $8 a course, I can cure you 95% of times. But if you are given the wrong doses, the wrong drugs, you take your treatment irregularly, your TB bacillus will mutate to a drug-resistant form. The drugs won't work. This kind of TB takes two years to treat. This kind costs thousands of dollars a course. 250 painful injections, 15,000 tablets. You thought seven days of antibiotics was too long. You stack those tablets up, and that is a 30-story tower your patient has to climb. 
These are drugs that make you go blind and deaf and pack your kidneys up. And look, if you're resistant to two of the drugs, we call you MDR, or multi-drug resistant TB. And if it's four, we call you XDR, which sounds pornographic, but means extensively drug-resistant TB. How many drugs do you think my patient Selma was resistant to? Take a guess. Twelve. And how many drugs did we have to treat TB at the time? We had 12. We called her totally drug-resistant TB. You know, I think Salma understood this concept of resistance faster than all of us in this room, myself included, because at each visit she sat across me, hopelessness in her eyes, and said, the drugs don't work. I take them, but they don't work. They wouldn't have. She was resistant to them all. Well, we wrote her up in a prominent medical journal, and suddenly, suddenly, after decades of neglect, TB could not be kept off the news, and perhaps off the nation's conscience, which was a good thing, because finally these marginalized, deprived patients had a voice. We were determined to cure her. We gave her a cocktail of every available drug left. We operated to remove her destroyed left lung, a pneumonectomy, but we were unsuccessful. Salma died two days after surgery, therapeutically destitute of an untreatable form of TB. Who killed Salma? That's easy to answer. We did, collectively. Drug resistance TB represents a collective indictment of us all as a society, of the tests that are too slow, of the drugs that are too toxic, of the government program that's underfunded and inefficient, of the private practitioners who will dole out the drugs, but no compassion, no science, of public policy failure, and of poverty. All these kill Salma. So time for a reality check, friends. It's the 4th of December today, and on our count, our shift already from the start of this year, 10 million globally are sick from TB, suffering from it, and 2 million are dead and 150,000 Indians with drug-resistant TB. That's the number we produce shamefully each year. Pack a train station the size of this room, desperate for a train that will relieve them. Instead, all they see is this sign, which speaks of delays, disruptions, disillusion. Please, Prime Minister Modi, Forget your bullet trains. Help our patients get on this one. And, and, and give us the tools we need to fight this scourge. Give me the drugs, the labs, the funds, and give us social change. Because TB is the perfect expression of an imperfect civilization, isn't it? There's, there's one final thing I almost forgot to say. And that is that Salma was a mother. And she often came with her four-year-old child. This is a haunting picture. I still can't sleep when I see it at night of mother and daughter on one of their multiple visits that's in my clinic. It turns out Salma had infected her daughter, living with her for 60 months and longer. It turns out that probably the strain was the same totally drug-resistant strain. I have yet to see a more TB-ravaged X-ray in a four-year-old child in all my 30 years of chest medicine. I know for a fact from her father that Aisha, her daughter, is still alive today. I know that Aisha is still coughing, therefore, today. And I guess that Aisha is still infecting many around her in Dharavi's crowded communities. You don't need to be a doctor to read that x-ray, just look into their eyes. But there are thousands of Salmas and thousands of Aishas, and I want each of you, as you leave this room for your lunch, to promise not to abandon them. Let's promise to treat all forms of tuberculosis irrespective of their resistance pattern. For each death from TB diminishes me, diminishes us, because it's preventable. All we need is collective will to turn the tide. For as the great Ibn Sina reminds us from a thousand years ago, he said, there are no incurable diseases. There is only lack of will. So I'll end where I began. This is not a glamorous disease. I'm sorry to put your mood off before lunch. I am no glamorous doctor. You've probably sussed that out already. 
But if working together, we can save some lives, what could be more glamorous than that?